All right, good evening. It's good to see everybody, and we're glad that you're with us. Those folks that have joined us online, thank you for being with us as well. We're getting started a little bit late. We've had uh, practice for the uh, uh, Christmas drama and things that are going on that will take place on the 18th. We hope you've made plans to join us then. I'm sure Brother Scott, in the time of announcements, will mention this again, but we look forward to seeing you for the dinner and the drama on that night, Sunday night, the 18th. We're going to get started singing together. I do want to remind you before we do that, if you need to send a prayer request in, please text us or email us. Tyler will throw that up there. There's the phone number and email address. Do that, and we would love to hear from you. O Little Town of Bethlehem is our first song that we'll sing tonight. in a manger. This is the non-traditional version, but let's sing it. Look now. 
of a king. Scott comes and sing old holy night.
Psalm 114. Psalm 114 this evening. It is good to see everybody in the Lord's house tonight. We'd like to welcome everyone. You folks joining us online, would like to welcome you as well. And um, on this cool, rainy December evening. And grateful for the rain and grateful that it's not ice or snow this early in the season. We'll take it a little bit later, but not yet. Well, let's wait till Christmas and maybe we'll pull a white Christmas out of a hat or something. Don't know. But it is good to see everybody. Tyler, if you will, throw our announcements up there real quick, sir. I believe we just got one on the 18th. It will be our uh, church banquet. It's a Christmas banquet at 5 o'clock. And then drama will follow at 6 o'clock. So if you will, bring some finger foods. And if you've got any questions, just see Kathy Kaler. And uh, she'll be glad to help you with that. And uh, Christmas morning... We will have uh, services at 11 o'clock on Christmas morning, and um, we will don't have a solid decision on Christmas night yet, but we will by Sunday or Sunday evening. So please remember those things, and um, we look forward to all of this. There will be no Sunday school on Sunday morning, Christmas Sunday morning, so remember that, and um, we will see you this Sunday. And so let's have a prayer request up there, Tyler. Um, you can take Matthew Robinson off of there. Um, and take Logan Denton off. Good, and we can take Eve off. Eve Johnson there on the last row. Roger, Roger Carter family. Roger, uh, which one? Matthew Robinson down the front first row, about four or five up from the bottom. All right. The Jason, what row are we in? Jason Sherman family, we can pull them off as well. Judy Creason, Judy Creason, and Tim Gross. C R E S O N G. Others we need to add tonight. Yeah, Rick. There you go. Um, and just Rick's going to be a granddad again, and Sherry's going to be a grandmom again, so we're glad for that. We can take the Tommy Trivet family off of there as well. But have, there we go. Thanks, Phil. How is Janet doing, Jimmy? <laughs> gotcha. We saw Joe today coming out of the hospital, and uh, seems to be, yeah, they were, yeah, they all had masks on and snotting and all that good stuff, so um, keep these in your prayers. Anybody else we need to add? Okay, I know we have many unspoken all over the house now. Any others? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, Robert, I'll ask you to lead us in prayer tonight, please, sir, if you will.
Psalm 114. Psalm 114. When Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of a strange of strange language, Judah was his sanctuary and Israel his dominion. The sea saw it and fled. Jordan was driven back. The mountains skipped like rams and the little hills like lambs. What ailed thee, O thou sea, that thou fleddest? Thou Jordan, that thou wast driven back. Ye mountains that ye skipped like rams and ye little hills like lambs. Tremble, thou earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, which turned the rock into a standing water, the flint into a fountain of waters. This is, um, as we looked at last week, through 113 through 118, these are um, psalms that were, in their entirety, from 113 to 118, were quoted um, during the time of Passover and other um, Jewish holy days. And as I as I read this, and I read this this chapter this week, 114, um, the psalmist takes him on a look back, as he often does to the nation of Israel, to what God has done. But this one was interesting to me, in that he it it. it he looks at a section or a certain subject, but yet it brings great comfort. There are, there are things that it's interesting, as I said often, it's funny to watch. Ironic funny, you can even say ha-ha funny, because we think we, think we have the skill set to control the weather. Um... We don't, and I know we don't, because if we could control it, our weathermen could be more accurate, right? You know, they're the only, they're the only profession I've seen that can be wrong 75% of the time and still have a job, because you can't control the weather. We try. We, we try to plan around the weather, right? You know, you, you will pull out your weather app. And you'll go down, you'll hit the radar, and you'll hit a button on Saturday morning. You're going to go out in the yard and work, and you see it, and, and uh, you're going to have to hurry up, or you're going to have to whatever, because it's going to start raining. You see the clouds coming through. It's going to start raining around 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock. And you get out there about 8 o'clock, and it starts raining at 8.30. Because we realize we don't control the weather. In fact, quite honestly, there is not one thing about nature we control. We can, you know, we can capture wild animals and we can put them in cages and bring them to the zoo or put them in the circus. But still yet, you're always warned, why, does, why do you not jump over into the fencing or into the pen with the man-eating lions at the zoo? Because they are still man-eating lions. You, you don't change their nature. Um... It's, it's interesting to see how nature is. You, you can't, we can't control the oceans. We can time them, so to speak. We can look at them and look at what they do. And we've learned over the years and over time when neap tide is and high tide and low tide and all that kind of stuff is. And we can, we can predict that. But when the hurricanes come through, we can say things about a storm surge. We can do different things. Sometimes a storm surge is a lot worse than it than we anticipated. Sometimes it's not near as bad as we anticipated, and um, and the weatherman, you know, they'll they'll tell us um, that there's going to be eight inches of snow. It's coming this way, and by the time it gets past Gate City, it's already dumped all its snow over in Gate City and over in Southwest Virginia, and it gets to us, and we don't get anything, and the kids are disappointed, and the teachers are disappointed, and the parents are disappointed, and all kinds of things because we were looking forward to that for whatever reason. I know teachers look forward to it because they get days out of school and the students the same way. And parents whose kids are out of school on a day that wasn't planned, they are panicking because they've got to figure things out. But we, th we think we can control it. And I mean, nature does some really crazy things. Nature does some extremely devastating things. And again, you can look at the, the recent hurricanes in Florida 
You can look at the recent tornadoes down south. We can board our windows up. We can do everything we can do to protect and to make sure that our structures make it through. And if the hurricane comes through and the winds are high enough, I don't care if you've got your doors boarded up. I don't care how hurricane proof you have made your house. It's probably going to get damaged or destroyed, one of the two. You can hurricane proof your home as much as you possibly can. But if the hurricane comes very close to your house, odds are no matter what you have done, it's going to blow your house over and it's going to be it's going to be done and so it can be very frightening and 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 as, as well it should there's folks who uh, they have they will tell you they have plan you know have hurricane plans and if you know evacuation plans for a hurricane they'll tell you in places where tornadoes are commonplace a lot of folks have uh, tornado shelters and underground shelters that they go into where they're protected they tell you but there's so there's only so much you can protect and so much you can do, and the rest of it is really at the mercy of God, to, that your house is spared or that you were spared or that your neighborhood is spared or whatever. It doesn't really matter. It does, it's something that we cannot control. Um, we have learned to control it to some degree. Uh, we can. The Army Corps of Engineers has changed the flow of rivers, and we've built dams, and we've done different things to help control flooding and that kind of stuff. But as far as controlling nature itself, we have no skill set to do that. In this chapter, we are reminded that nature is at God's disposal to use however he so desires. Now, to me, that is a great comfort because not not because he controls the hurricanes and he, that, yeah that's that's comforting too he knows where they're going he does he put they, they go where they go they do what they do and all of these kind of things but the fact that there is some we, we have no control over it. i mean they talk about what do they talk about seeding clouds so we can get rain they talk about doing that kind of stuff with with dries or whatever some kind of chemical that they want to seed the clouds with so we can get rain and all these kind of things and uh that we that we have this ability to uh stop the world from warming or you know you know, if you remember, if you're old enough to remember it, uh, when in the 70s they were predicting what? They were not predicting global warming in the 70s. What were they predicting? Another ice age. Another ice age. I, I, still, am, I still am under the firm belief that we, we do not have, even in the time we've been able to collect data about the weather, we do not have enough data yet to say this is an abnormal cycle of weather, or this is a normal cycle of weather. That's why they have gone to, because it, it, it's not warming up like they said it would and like their computer model said it would. So this is why, we, instead of global warming, we now call it what? Climate change. So it doesn't matter what it is. If the world goes cold tomorrow, there's something we're doing that makes it go cold. If the world goes hot tomorrow, there's something we're doing that causes it to go hot. We... We don't know, we don't, in other words, we don't know how we can control it, what it's going to do. We're just trying to figure out how to do that. The nation of Israel is reminded here that the God we serve has nature under control. He uses it at his disposal to accomplish his purposes, to do what he desires, and here in these verses, to take care of his people. Some interesting things about these verses, and, and we'll, be, we'll be finished. When Israel went out of Egypt, we all know how that occurred, the house of Jacob from a people of a strange language. Something I want to just point out here that uh, I was reading some of the commentaries and looking at... Um, the psalmist takes us back to a look on the eve of the exodus from Egypt in Exodus chapter 13, verse 3. But the thing that I, I was interested about in looking at, the land of Goshen was one of the most fertile parts of Egypt on the northeast border of Egypt, closest to Canaan. And if we remember, why were they put in the land of Goshen? The land of Goshen was not close to where Jacob was. I mean, where Joseph was. Goshen was kind of way outside of town. Why did they settle in Goshen? Why were they put out there? One, Pharaoh told Joseph to pick wherever he wanted to put them. 
Secondly, what did Joseph tell his brothers that the Egyptians hated? Do you remember? What? Sheep and, and sheep herders. They hated shepherds. In fact, and unless they'd been asked directly, Joseph had instructed him, don't tell them what you do. <laughs> We're keepers of sheep, and we hate sheep herders. So we're going to go way out here where nobody bugs us because this is what we do. We're not pyramid builders. We're not sphinx builders. We're sheep herders. This is what we do. We are shepherds of the sheep. We tend sheep. Okay? So it puts it out there, and, and it was, they were put in a place, quite honestly, that they really didn't have to do much assimilation. Um, probably had to do some things to conduct business, but they did not have to assimilate into the culture. And they did not. It says there in the, in the end of verse 1 that when they left Egypt, and how long were they in Egypt before they left? All right, you've answered enough, Richard. You're done. Okay. You know, you've you got your two free gift cards. You're done now. You, you know. I'll, I'll, do you, I'll do you like I did this uh, young man at Jacob's church. He had a birthday party. His name's Daniel. And uh, Daniel had a birthday. They had a birthday party for him down there. And I gave him a, a gift card. I re-gifted a, a, a restaurant gift card. And I felt really bad because he took it to the restaurant. It had nothing on it. <laughs> so I had to get him another one. So uh, anyway, but uh, they were there for 400, 400 years. Now you would think in 400 years Egypt had grown. We know the children of Israel had grown because they were slaves because Pharaoh got scared of them. He said, there's so many of them, they could overtake us if they wanted to. So we got to do something. So they made them servants or made them slaves. But it says, they, it says they left the land and the people of a strange language. Even though they were there, they kept themselves separate from the Egyptians. They kept themselves away from and did not want to assimilate into that culture. Did not want to become part of it. And that just reminded me again that we are, we are strangers in this world. We are part of it. We're here in it to influence it, but, to not, but not to assimilate into it. That's not that we step back from it and are, and are weirdos, so to speak. Or, you know, but we do not assimilate. Our belief system is not, does not assimilate. Our morals do not assimilate. Our language does not assimilate. Our thought processes do not assimilate. We do not do those things. We base who we are and what we are on Scripture that more increasingly as you grow in sanctification, you become less and less, comfortable is the wrong word, but, uh, but less and less uh, accommodating to this world. It becomes more of a foreign place to you. It, it becomes more of a place that you're uncomfortable in, so to speak, a place that is the, the worldly part of it. It becomes more uninteresting to you. It's just not something you want to be a part of because it doesn't mix with your or match with your goals or match with your convictions. And if you want to look at the shepherds in Joseph, Exodus chapter 47, verse 1 is there. But then you look in verses, you, you look in verse 2, Judah was his sanctuary and Israel his dominion. This is the land of Canaan. This is where he went. This was their sanctuary. This is where... They were headed back to. This was the land of promise. And then you look in verse 3 through 6, and it says this, The sea saw it and fled. Jordan was driven back. So what does he speak of there? Two things. What are, what are the two things he speaks of? When they left Egypt, what sea parted? The Red Sea parted. And when, when, was, Jordan, when was Jordan pushed back? When they went into Canaan, it said when the, and you can, you can see that in um, Exodus 14 and Joshua chapter 3. It says in Joshua chapter 3, the priests would be carrying the ark, and when they put their foot out to step on the water, that Jordan would be held back. And again, in Jordan, they walked through on dry land to get to the land of promise. This is, this is something that is, uh, when, you, when you look at the Red Sea, you see a lot of things. Um, you see, there, you see um, 
their enemy vanquished when it was over, once the children of Israel had walked all the way through, and the Egyptians said, we're going after them. The sea was closed. But to me, the, the, the thing is to be wowed by the fact that it is pushed back. To, I mean, just I can't imagine standing there watching that occur. Can you? I mean, just we, we think beavers building dams are pretty cool, right? Can you, can you imagine standing at South Holston Dam and the water just part all the way back? And you walk from one end to the other on dry, not, not mushy ground, but on dry. But, but to actually see that. And, and, and honestly, how wide that had to be to get that many people and that many animals and that much through there in that short period of time. Because it was, it was not days and days that it took them to get through there. It was, it was, in the, it was through a night and they all got through. And then the sea closed on, closed on, on the, 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 uh, the Egyptian soldiers. And then in Jordan, it was the same. They, they went across. But then you say, and then it says, uh, the mountains skipped like rams and the little hills like lambs. What ailed thee, O sea, that thou fleddest? There was nothing that ailed it. It was pushed back. Thou, Jordan, thou wast driven back. And you look at, and we'll look at the other verses in the middle. But look, if you will, please, down at verse 8. Which turned the rock into a standing water. Now think about this. When you were a kid, and they talked about Moses speaking to the rock, and the because and the, they know Moses spoke to it once and he hit it once, okay? So he spoke to the rock and water flowed from the rock. When you're a kid thinking about that, how do you how do you envision that in your mind? How much water had to come from that rock to take care of the thirst needs and the water needs of well over a million people? It, it wasn't just a trickle. It wasn't just a squirt. It wasn't just a little waterfall. It says there it created standing water. In other words, to me it created a lake where they could gather and get water. And wa I mean, they had to water themselves, had to water their animals. I mean, all kinds of things that they had to do with that water. So, and you, and when, again, when you're talking about well over a million people having to have this done, the amount of water that came out of that rock, how big the rock was, we do not know. You know, but, you know, as a kid, you're thinking, you know, there's a, a stream that comes out of it, this stream that flows out. No, there was a gushing river flowing out of there to take care of them. And then, and then the second time, the flint into a fountain of waters. This was just a massive amount. That God, that God supplied that, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I've never gone up and talked to a rock and watched water flow out of it. I've never gone up and hit a rock and seen water come out of it. I've, I've never prayed over one that water came out of. I've never done anything like that. But when God's people were in need, God even has the power to make nature do something that it doesn't normally do. Water doesn't normally flow out of a rock. Yeah, there are places that you can see it flows out of the side of the mountain, but it comes from somewhere. And this just came out of nowhere, and it flowed out of the rock. And, that, that he, and this is, to me, it's, it's a reminder of going back to the children of Israel, not only to say, in these times God delivered you, but again, in this time, look at the power of the God who did deliver you. In, in, verse, in chapter 13, 113, we talked, he talked about praising God because of all of the things he does. And here he talks about the power of God. And if the God we serve has power to control nature in ways that, I mean, in, in ways that is not normal, how much more does he control the events of our lives? How much more does he control what goes on with us? Verse 7. He speaks to the earth, tremble. The word there is writhe. Writhing like writhing in pain. There was a, a gentleman years ago, a few years back at the hospital, young guy, probably in his 40s, early 50s, had had a couple of back surgeries. 
and had done well. I mean, he'd done what the doctors had told him, and he was out working on a tractor or riding a tractor over his farm, and he hit a bump, hit a hard bump, and he told me, he said, as soon as I hit it, I knew exactly what had happened. He said, I crawled off the mower, told my, I mean, off the, the tractor, told my wife to get me to the hospital. We're not talking about some wimpy guy. He was, I mean, he was not a big heavy guy, but he was a stout fella. And he was there the whole time I was trying to get him, because we'd, we'd give him some pain meds. We'd done some things to try to help him. But he was hurting so bad, I mean, sweat was pouring off of him. He had the, the, the side rails white knuckled, and he could not sit still. He was hurting. So, I mean, he was set this way, set this way, turn this way, twist this way, move this. Way. I mean, whatever he could do into whatever position he could get into to try to get himself comfortable. He was writhing in pain. He was hurt. Tremble to nature. Tremble. This is nature. Tremble at your God, at the one who controls you. Hebrews 10, 31 says to us, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. To think of a, of a God who can control nature, what kind of power he has, should cause us to tremble. Should cause us to fall in worship before him. This is this tossing and turning, this tremble at the presence of the Lord of Yahweh. And this gives them another comfort here of the all-seeing, all-knowing, uncreated God. And then he turns it around and he says, and this God, Yahweh, is your God. This one who controls all of this and who has this kind of power. I mean, imagine that. Would it, would it not scare you that if you walk down to the lake, as, even the lake as low as it is right now, and you were, you were standing on the banks and you said, you know, I'd like to go over there. My friend lives up those steps. And if I don't have a heart attack, get in there, I'd love to go over and see my friend. Let's get in there. We'll have to drive. And they go, no, 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 no. Hang on just a minute. They just held their hand out and the waters parted. Would that not scare you? You go, I'd love to have a friend like that. I'm not real sure. Because <laughs> he or she might turn that around on me at some point and I might not like it. You know, that kind of power would be really cool as long as they used it in your benefit, not to your detriment, but, you know, not to your pain, but to somebody else's or something would be really cool or something like that. But then you, you turn that around and, and it goes in a direction that says not only is this one who has all of this power to control nature, he is your God. He is your sovereign. What does this bring to me? Well, this brings comfort to me for several reasons. One, that what he says will come to pass. The things that he promises he will do for me will come to pass. The things that he promises he will do for my benefit, not necessarily that benefit, but for my benefit, the destruction of Satan, the destruction of sin, the destruction of this sinful world, the creation of a new heaven and a new earth, and to be with him forever. These things will come to pass. He will be sure of it. He has the power to do it. But this God who has all of this power is so benevolent towards you. Is so humble and so patient and so merciful and so graceful towards you. This is who you serve. It should make us fear in a reverential, respectful way. It should make us fear because of who He is. And it should make us appreciate for what He has done. For it is He who, planned, who gave us the plan of salvation. And it is He who made for us a way home.
because on Calvary's cross and in the grave, he did something that goes completely against nature. It is not natural. In fact, if you were at the grave of a loved one and you were placing flowers upon that grave and all of a sudden, even the grave of a loved one, the ground began to break up and they begin to pull up out of that grave, what would you do? You probably wouldn't sit there and go, hey, how you doing? It's good to see you. You would probably be doing the same thing I would be doing. Running. And if they showed up at the door of your house, you probably wouldn't answer it. Because it's unnatural. Resurrection from the dead is not a natural thing. Staying dead is the natural thing. It is. One day in our lives, God will perform the unnatural. Listen, the rapture is an unnatural occurrence. We, without some kind of propulsion, we do not just fly upwards. But those who are left when Christ returns will. Those, as Paul said, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up in the air to be with him. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Those are unnatural things. But because he can make nature do unnatural things, we know that he can do these unnatural things for us when it's time. In its time and in its way and in his plan, he can do these things for our benefit because he has this kind of power. He just mentions a couple here. He doesn't mention a lot. He doesn't mention about when they came out of Egypt and all the plagues and how unnatural that was in creation for, for part of Egypt. And I've often wondered how that worked when the darkness came. There were some of the plagues that plagued Israel and Egypt, and then there were some that just plagued Egypt, and one of them was the darkness. And I don't know if Israel on their part of it could look in and see the darkness or if Egypt could look out and see the light. I don't know if they could do that or not. But it said the darkness was powerful. And for somebody to have that kind of power, that they could make the sun shine here but not here and not even the moon or the stars, completely terribly pitch black here and everything normal over here. Awe-inspiring, yes. Fearful, yes. Comforting, of course. Because the presence of the one that the earth trembles at is our God, our King, and the one who will bring all things to pass that he has promised that one day we'll be with him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Father, thank you for your power. That, Father, we see in snippets as we see nature do, its, do what it does. Father, to us, natural occurrences, the, the warmth, the warm air, the cold air, churning over the seas. Father, brings dangerous, sometimes life-taking weather patterns. Father, the swirl of the air and the right pressures and the right things that come together that cause the funnel clouds and the, the, the tornadoes. Father, the heavy rains that bring flooding. Just all of those things. Lord, they do not happen outside of your control. And Father, when nature is used in unnatural ways, and unnatural things occur, you cause that to happen. Father, in the days of the prophets, you caused an iron axe head to float. You caused a donkey to talk. 
Father, all kinds of things that you have control over and can make do whatever you want it to do at your command. And Father, that brings me great comfort. Because Father, one day you will take me home. Father, one day unnatural things will occur. The dead in Christ shall rise first. We which remain will be caught up to meet with you. Father, it will be unnatural. It will have to be explained away because it will not be able to be explained. It will have to be explained away. For Father, you do great things. Father, I pray that you will do, Lord, the unnatural among us. Lord, that we would see people saved. Father, change our lives in ways as your children change our lives in ways that only you can. But Father, we are drawn closer to you. Father, we are more like your son Christ. And we are a greater influence in this world because we're like him than ever before. Father, dismiss us now in thy care. Lord, take us home safely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we'll do the uh, doxology. Jim, do that tonight. We'll be dismissed. Let's all stand to our feet. Thank you.